Um, uh, this way for the gas, ladies and gentlemen, is a it's a great book. Um, it's it's a classic of uh, World War II and Holocaust literature. If you take any other courses in Holocaust literature, chances are you're going to be reading um, this book. Um, so th some themes to keep in mind while you read is the idea of camp existence versus outside existence. So what is existence like inside the camp versus what is existence like outside of the camp? And what uh, this leads to really is the idea that we've you know, had for a while uh, about morality in the extreme situation. Is morality contingent, right, depending on uh, the uh, circumstances you're in? And so is, mor you know, morality outside the camp where you get to live and work and, you know, you know relatively, in relative freedom uh, versus, you know, morality inside the camp where all that is different, right? You, you have no freedom. You're, you're subject to the will of other people. Um, another thing to keep in mind is Eros and Thanatos. Now, this is a bit of a, it can be a bit of a strange idea, but I'll try to explain it briefly. So Eros is basically, um, well, Eros, it, it comes from love, right? Uh, Latin love uh, or Greek. Um, he was actually the god of love. Um, so Eros is life. It's the sex drive, right? In psychoanalytical terms. And then you have Thanatos, and Thanatos is death. Uh, Thanatos was the realm of the dead. Of, I think he was the god of the dead or something like that. So you have this, these two very you know, distinct ideas, right? And seemingly there should be no connection between them, Eros and Thanatos, death, uh, life drive, sex drive, and death drive, right? Well, Freud gets a hold of this, and he, he, he shows something completely different. That actually, there is a very tight uh, connection, tightly knit connection between Eros and Thanatos, um, despite what you might think. And, you know, one way of explaining this is, for example, um, you know, how many times have you heard, you know, um, you, know the, you know, the most thrilling moment someone's had in their life is when they were close to death. So, you know, why do people jump out of airplanes with, with parachutes? Why do we ride roller coasters? Why do we bungee jump, right? Why do we drive our cars 100 miles an hour, you know, for a few moments, right? It's this, the only, you know, the, 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 the meaning in life, life having any kind of meaning is the fact that it ends, right? So there's this entire connection between the two. If, if life never ended, it would, maybe there would be meaning. I don't know. I couldn't, I, I can't fathom what kind of meaning that would have, but the way we exist where there's an end point and we know there's an end point is what gives our lives meaning, right? Without that end point, it would be different, right? And so the fact of death actually gives life meaning. And, you know, you can see it in other ways too, like, um, um, why do, why do plants grow? Why do, why, do, how do we live? How do animals live? Animals live off of death. Our life is fueled by death, whatever it is. If, even if you're a vegan, you're still eating something that was living, right? You're, if you eat a tomato, you're taking the life of the tomato in order for you to live, right? So, uh, you know, I, I garden, uh, and I take leaves and I take, uh, table scraps and I put them into a compost pile and that compost I use to grow other plants. So these new plants are being fueled by the death of other plants, right? So there's this connection then between the life drive and the death drive. Um, so, all right, so that's a quick explanation. So as you read this, I want you to think about how that theme, I guess, the connection between Eros and Thanatos, how that theme can be found in the book, in, in different stories and in different places within the book. Keep that in mind. Uh, also to keep in mind is, especially with camp literature, you're we're going to start talking a lot about the casualness of, de of uh, murder, of mass death, um, how casually Nazis were able to, to kill millions of people, um, the industrialization of, of murder that the Nazis nearly perf uh, perfected, um, the process of dehumanization in the camps. 
keep that in mind. And then also a very important um, idea to keep in mind is control and power. Um, uh, this is this isn't just a camp specific um, theme. I, we saw, we see it working in Karski as well. Uh, Nazis are trying to control. They want the power. How do you deal with that, right? Um, okay, so I want to just, this is going to be a short video. I just wanted to point out a couple of things in this book um, that I found particularly interesting. Oh, another theme to keep in mind is the theme of the, uh, the, the myth of the passive Jew. So I'm going to actually speak about this in a particular point in the book. But um, what do I mean by that? The, the myth of the passive Jew. So you, you, you would not remember this at all. Maybe even your parents wouldn't. But um, when Holocaust, not literature maybe, but like especially uh, movies began to be made, um, like the first one that was really, you know, got some popularity in, in the United States was called, I think it was just called Shoah or Holocaust or something like that. And it was actually a five-part miniseries on TV. And I, I remember watching this. And the way Jewish victims of the Holocaust were often um, presented were as these passive um, uh, uh, victims who were almost led to their deaths like sheep, like they didn't put up any kind of struggle. And I think the reason that choice was made by filmmakers and, and others was that for, I think the thinking was that somehow um, the passive victim is somehow it's easier to um, it's easier to uh, uh empathize with the passive victim, the, the person who, you know, resists and uses violence to keep from going to the gas chamber is somehow uh, less empathetic. You, you're less, you're, you're less able to empathize with them or something. I don't know. I, it doesn't, it never made much sense to me. Um, and after studying the, you know, the world war two and the Holocaust for a while, it, it's a completely false um, uh, uh, image there was a lot of resistance by Jews um, during the Holocaust. Um, there's a great movie with Harvey Keitel and, and other really good actors called The Gray Zone. And it's about Auschwitz. And it, it tells the story of um, uh, the, in the men's camp of Auschwitz, they, um, they uh, smuggled in lots of gum, just a ton of gunpowder, like in little doses over a long period of time. And they were able to create huge bombs. And this actually happened. They blew up two crematorium and damaged a third in this revolt. Um, and that is not passive. That is not the act of a passive victim. That is the act of an active um, re resistant fight, resistance fighter, right? So, this whole myth of the, of the, of the passive Jew then is now beginning to be destroyed in, in, uh, in our popular culture. When I was growing up though, the popular image of Jewish victims was they were very passive, but you know, um, Inglorious Bastards is a great movie that, uh, you know, that destroys that. I know it's fiction, but at the same time, it's a great new perspective of it. Um, you know, there are other, uh, works, cultural works that, 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 uh, kind of, um, undermine this idea of Jews as being passive victims to their own death, to their own murder. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, so I'm going to just hit a couple spots in the book. The first one is in the introduction on page 14. So this is, um, this is from the introduction of the book with the exception of the official collaborationist daily newspaper and a couple of semi-pornographic weeklies, not a single Polish periodical appeared legally in German-occupied Poland. Yet in Warsaw alone, there appeared each day several dozen underground leaflets and war bulletins transcribed from radio stations in the West. Uh, political periodicals of every orientation came out. So um, this, is, this is an amazing fact to me. 
Um, there was one collaborationist daily newspaper in, uh, in, in Poland, and that was it. Uh, no other Polish language paper, no other legal Polish paper was produced, but there were a ton of illegal, of, of underground periodicals that came out all the time. There were these secret presses where people were just producing pamphlets and, and uh, books and uh, magazines and newspapers and you know distributing distributing them all every day um so that was just it's just an amazing resistant act to me that no one very few people uh co um uh cooperated with the german authorities to produce you know german acceptable uh uh polish language papers uh publication. So I, I, I thought that I always find that really interesting. Page 19. Okay, so this is a very important uh, point to keep in mind. So I'm just going to read this. Um, so this is after, this is talking about how after uh, This Way for the Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, was published um, and how shocking it was to the public <clears throat> when it came out. And it says, uh, the public were expecting, the public was expecting martyrologies. Martyrologies. That's an important word to keep in mind. The, the Communist Party called for works that were ideological, that divided the world into the righteous and the unrighteous, heroes and traitors, communists and fascists. Borowiecki, uh, Borowski was accused of amorality, decadence, and nihilism. Yet at the same time, it was clear to everyone that Polish literature had gained a dazzling new talent. So, Martyrology. What is a martyrology? So martyrology is uh, is the glory, the glorification of the the martyred, of the victims, right? Uh, for a long time, well, under communism, really, until 1989, there was only one, basically one legal way of discussing the Holocaust in Poland, and that was that Poles were the victims. Period. Uh, that Poles and well, and other Soviets were the victims of World War II and the Holocaust. There were some Jewish victims, but they were not nearly as important as the Poles who died, who the, uh, the Poles who were martyred. And that's what the, the government wanted you to produce. You, they wanted you to produce these simple black and white stories, uh, uh, pieces of, of culture that described what had just happened in very stark terms. There were, there were the righteous and there were the unrighteous. There were the the, the fascists, the, the Nazi fascists, and there were the communist victims of fascism, period. And Borowski doesn't do that. His, his work is, is not that black and white. Throughout, you get these instances where the difference between the victim and, and the, uh, and the uh, executioner, the lines begin to blur a little bit uh, because you're in this you're in this gray zone. I mean, that's a great way of putting it, uh, where um, the the uh, ability to to recognize uh, clear cut morality is is diminished, right? Um, and so the communists didn't really like it. <laughs> they they did not like what he produced. But as it said in the last sentence it was obvious that he was a new star in Polish literature. His writing was so spectacular. There was no way that they were going to be able to keep it from being published and put out in the world. He was just too good to keep silent. Um, and so this was a, this is a very rare example of that kind of uh, non martyrological work. Um, it's almost a miracle that it was, it was pr produced. Um, with the stranglehold the communists of the time had on uh, on cultural production, uh, most everything that was coming out of the time were these very, were were just that were these very um, simple you know the worker is right the fascist was wrong you know there's no in between right the the worker was the victim the pole was the victim and we need to ignore the Jews we need to ignore what happened to the Jews what what was really wrong was what happened to poles. And Borowski doesn't do that. He does not. Uh, he does not follow that line. Um, so it really is a miracle that this. It, it, it's a small miracle that this was. This, this was let out into the world. Because very little like this was was allowed. Um, so page twenty. 
three, the, uh, there's a little, yes, here we go. In Borowski's Auschwitz story, uh, in, sorry, in Borowski's Auschwitz stories, the difference between executioner and victim is stripped of all greatness and pathos. It is brutally reduced to a second bowl of soup, an extra blanket, or the luxury of a silk shirt and shoes with thick soles about which Vorarbeiter Tadeusz, Tadeusz is so proud. So yeah, that getting to that non-martyrological uh, bent in it. Um, page 25. Um, this is very stark. This is a very um, tragic kind of line. For Borowski, the son of Soviet prisoners and the posthumous child of Auschwitz, the whole world is a concentration camp, was and will be. What will the world know of us if the Germans win? Borowski called his book about Auschwitz a voyage to the limit of a particular experience. At the limit of that experience, Auschwitz is no exception but the rule. So this is a, you know, after what he experiences in the camp, this becomes... I mean, the, accu the, the accusation of calling him a, a nihilist is, is fair, um, but it's not wrong. Uh, he, he's not wrong. Uh, after his experiences, after seeing his uh, parents shipped off to, um, to uh, the gulag in, in, um, in uh, 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 Siberia, and then he himself experiencing imprisonment in, a, in another concentration camp, you have to, there, there's no, there's no, um, there's no judgment for me for his nihilism. Um, and it ends up killing him uh, not long after this was published and not long after he became famous, actually. He killed himself. It was just, too, the camp was still in, he was still in the camp after, after, uh, you know, for the rest of his life. He never truly escaped the camp. It became too much of his uh, psyche, of his, of his being. And it was too much for him to ever leave behind. Uh, and it was a, that was a common occurrence, actually, for camp survivors. Um, it happened all the time. People, years later, finally giving, not being able to um, fight it any longer. The, the despair that came with experiencing the camp. Um, page 26. This is another instance of uh, that kind of nihilism. So he says, quote, the living are always right, the dead are always wrong. That's just a poetic line. That's just poetry right there. The living are always right, the dead are always wrong, because the living are living. The living are alive, so they're right, period. The dead are wrong, because they have no voice anymore. They can't, they can't be right. Um, and that's, the kind of, that's, a, that's an attitude that is created from this, exper this camp experience, from... Um, the things he was forced to do, uh, the way he was forced to live, that comes out of this. Th this kind of um, belief comes out of that experience. So, um, so page 29. I'm not going to explain this too much. Um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a prompt because it's part of our discussion forum. And I want you to think about it. I'm not just going to give it to you. But the first paragraph of the story, This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, it ends on page 30. It's a couple lines into 30. <clears throat> I want you to think about um, in what way the human is being dehumanized here. Okay, I want you to consider what the equation is that he's uh, uh, prompting in, the, in, this, in this paragraph. So... Think about that as you read this paragraph. <coughs> Page 49. <clears throat> you know, don't ignore the rest of the, of the story, but these are just the few little spots I, I, um, I found particularly interesting that I want to bring up in, a, in this little bit of a lecture. Um, so, page 49. It's a paragraph near the middle. So I'm going to read it, and then I'll give you a bit of a prompt on it. It is almost over. The dead are being cleared off the ramp and piled into the last truck. The Canada men, weighed down under a load of bread, marmalade, and sugar, and smelling of perfume and fresh linen, line up to go. For several days, the entire camp will live off this transport. 
for several days, the entire camp will talk about Sosnoviets benzene. Sosnoviets benzene was a good, rich transport. So with that paragraph, that's one of the instances, that's one of the places in this book where I want you to think about the connection between Eros and Thanatos. Okay, this is one of those places where that theme really um, uh, comes into, into fruition. Um, page 146. Uh, this is this is the death of Schillinger story, the short story, the death of Schillinger. Um, so note the irony of what Sch when Schill Schillinger says, "Oh Gott, mein Gott, was habe ich getan, dass ich so leiden muss," which means, "Oh God, my God, what have I done to, des to deserve such suffering?" So consider the irony of that statement. And then also, this is this story is a really good. Um, um, illustration of that um, subversion of the myth of the passive Jew that this this story is a really good is really good at doing that subverting that whole notion that Jews were passive victims 